Good evening, and welcome to The Power of Us, a discussion with trans, gender nonconforming leaders. I'm Barbara Satin, Faith Work Director at the National LGBTQ Task Force. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm so pleased to be the one to welcome you to this discussion session tonight on behalf of the National LGBTQ Task Force and more than 30 other sponsoring groups. The event this evening takes on a special meaning as it falls on a day which carries worldwide impact. May 17th is the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, and Transphobia. This morning, I was invited to be on a call with the White House to affirm the administration's support, both globally and nationally, for the principle that the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And I look forward to hearing from each of our illustrious panel members on what that principle of the inherent dignity and equal and inalienable rights means to them as we work through a, a number of questions designed to uncover their hope, dreams, and concerns about equality. But before I do that, I wanna take a few moments to salute and applaud our sponsors for this discussion session. We're delighted that so many organizations have signed on to be part of tonight's Power of Us discussion. More than 30 groups have signed on, and I ask you to watch the following slides acknowledging these supportive sponsors. Take a few minutes to view the slides carrying the names of our co-sponsors, an impressive group of organizations. We're also overwhelmed by the terrific registration for this session and all the people still entering the room. So take a few minutes and we'll be right back to meet our panel. So let's begin the Power of Us discussion. And first off, let me remind you that uh, Originally, Timber Hudson was going to be the moderator, and unfortunately, Timber lost their voice and is not being not able to participate. So I said I would step in and take over that role, but it's hard to take over for Timber. And we also, unfortunately, we lost Rodrigo. No, I'm sorry, we lost um, Rodrigo's stepping in for the other panelists. Uh, Ezra Farley Collins, who also came down sick. But Rodrigo Hang Lennon from National Center for Trans Equality um, stepped, stepped up. And we also have Ariana Lint from the Ariana Center and Sam Brenton from the Trevor Project. So I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. What's your name, your pronoun? title as an individual or representative of an organization and any identities and cultural backgrounds you'd like to us to share. So let's go through that first and then we'll begin the questions um, right after that. So message for Sam, would you be willing to start? Hear me? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Uh, hey, y'all. My name is Sam Brenton. I use they and them as my pronouns. I have the illustrious honor of serving as the Vice President of Advocacy and Government Affairs for the Trevor Project, which if you don't know is the nation's LGBTQ suicide prevention and crisis intervention program. Identities that I hold include being, um, I identify as bisexual, I identify as gender fluid, uh, I identify as mixed race, and I identify as a nerd. So um, I also definitely think that that's a, part, a core part of my identity. So looking forward uh, to this great conversation. Thanks so much for having me. Ariana, do you want to be next? You're on mute. You're muted, Ariana. Now? Hello, yes. I'm sorry. 
Yes. Hello, how you doing, everybody? Hola a todos. My name is Ariana Lin. I am the CEO and founder of Ariana Center. My pronouns is she, her, hers, ella. And as I told you, uh, my name is Ariana Lin, and I am the CEO of Ariana Center. What is uh, provide direct services and advocacy for transgender women of color, particularly Latinx um, and Black trans woman and Black transgender women. They are the amongst uh, the most vulnerable population in South Florida and Puerto Rico because we have office in Florida and Puerto Rico. Trans women of color suffer disproportionate and race and HIV diagnostic, employment and housing discrimination, as well as preju pre prejudice related stigma with a result and high instance of violence and hate crime. And then we're going to talking later and we're going to address it more later. But thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be in this panel with the task force specifically. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. And Rodrigo, welcome. Would you introduce yourself and your pronouns and all of that? You're muted, Rodrigo. Okay, can you all hear me now? We can. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Before I was saying, host is not allowed to unmuting, I think, because, you know, <laughs> uh, credit to the host. So we're trying to manage some other stuff on the back end. Um, so, hey, everyone, my name is Rodrigo, or Rigo for short. I use he, him pronouns, and I work at the National Center for Transgender Equality. I'm currently the one of the two deputy executive directors, and I'll be following our founder to be the executive director uh, in this summer. Um, and I'm really excited to be here tonight talking about the Equality Act. Um, I used to work at the task force what feels like an eternity ago, um, working on an earlier version of the Equality Act when it was employment only. So it's really exciting for um, now for us to have gotten to the point as a movement where we could dream bigger than only employment protections and, and think about the full spectrum um, of protections in our daily life. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Barbara. Thank you. What a wonderful panel. Looking forward to all of your expressions of concern. And why don't we start with each of you sort of responding to the question of how has your experience as a member of the trans non-binary community impacted the way you navigate the world? So whoever wants to jump in first. Go ahead, Sam. Um. There we go. Sorry, because our awesome folks are uh, uh, not letting us unmute. We may take us a little bit of time, folks. If you see us trying, we're trying to get there, but we're also trying to be safe. So uh, thank you again to our awesome hosts doing that great work. So um, the question of, of kind of my experiences with, with this work is definitely framed um, in my in my experiences as a, a child, right? Like a, as a young person coming into to understanding myself, having a, an affirmative space would have been a lifesaver. Um, instead, I kind of had to try to make those affirmative spaces for myself, which is not fair to be putting onto any young person. Uh, we should be creating spaces where they can grow and become themselves um, without the, that risk. So what do I think of when, I, when I'm thinking of the Equality Act and I'm trying to think of how this, this affected me? I'm thinking of the, the simple stats, again, as a nerd, right? Like if you have an affirming space in your life, you are a quarter as likely to attempt suicide, right? Like if you are a trans and non-binary person who has their pronouns respected, right? You are half as likely to attempt suicide. So it's not um, kind of, it's not, out there, it's not rocket science, right? Um, it's literally just creating spaces where we can be affirmed because that's life-saving. So whenever we think of um, the Equality Act and we're thinking of some, you know, well, how's it really going to affect, you know, oh my goodness, my credit score, right? Like, what is that really to do? It's creating an affirmative space for business, for, for life, right, for education. 
it's creating those affirmative spaces and that's what saves lives. So that's kind of how I connect my, my, my experiences to the work. Great. Thank you. Ariana, do you want to share how, uh, how it's impacted the way you navigate the world, your trans and non-binary uh, experience? Well, first of all, I have to let you know what, um, as a transgender person and representing the most vulnerable community, trans Latinas, and I have a very, very, uh, a lot of labels in my head, right? Um, um, I'm openly living with HIV and everything. What's terrible for me navigating the system and specific for the support, but also later I find um, amazing leaders, amazing person who they want to have the same passion uh, and, and, and the same and the same for, for everybody, better quality of life, no better quality of my life, better quality of the whole transgender community life. And that's why uh, God put me angels in my, in, my, in my journal, in my life, and I'm working right now. And I, I, I'm, I'm always trying to, um, trying to be the, 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 the bridge of the vulnerable community or people or the, or the community with never, never being touched with communities um, uh, in power. And I feel fortunate to I have the trust of the vulnerable community in South Florida and Puerto Rico. And, and what we need is the support because uh, in Florida, we already have um, a, a data. We create data, but because it's important for us, uh, advocate for, advocate, but have uh, some, some support, some data, some complement. So in Miami or in Fort Lauderdale, we have data, but in Puerto Rico, right now we partner with University of Puerto Rico and we we doing some amazing um, need assessment for Puerto Rico. And that is very important because over there, we're going to really, really know what is the needs of the transgender community, what is discrimination, housing, uh, 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 healthcare, you know, as a transgender person uh, and living with HIV uh, and get vaccination in South Florida was so difficult. You know, even even though I have a pre-existing condition, imagine for other transgender who they don't have the privilege as I have or the connection or the support what I have. So I think it's a very good information. Uh, um, and my life was so grateful to working with uh, amazing people like these people in this panel, working for the same for the same dream, like better quality of life for everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Rico. Give us your take. Wow. Well, I mean, I would really echo everything that that Sam and Ariana were saying. I mean, I'm for speaking for myself as a transgender man, and I'm a mixed race, white and Latino. I'm Cuban American, and I mean, I think that being like in my well, in my experience, there have been times in my life when I've been more visibly trans, and times when I haven't been. Um, when I came out as transgender, I did not medically transition for a while. Um, and so I had a number of years there where uh, it was very apparent that I was not fitting either of the dominant gender boxes in our society. Now I'm in a situation where if I go to the grocery store, most people that I see at the store uh, probably don't think about um, me being trans either way. And for me, having both of those experiences, having, you know, time in my life where it was very obvious to strangers that I wasn't fitting the mold and times when I wasn't, really showed me how differently people get treated based on just who they're perceived to be. Um, and there's, that's so unfair. I mean, it sounds um, so obvious that, you know, it's not even maybe even seem like it's not worth saying, but I think it's a reminder of really what's at stake. Like at the end of the day, we're just trying to go to the grocery store, try to live our lives, hang out with our friends without having to be scared, without having to be scared that we're going to be punished somehow for being who we are or for sticking out. Um, and that's, that's why it's so important to change policy and change culture. I'm a big believer that those two things go hand in hand. They each inform the other. Um, and, you know, you, there's all of this research at NCTE. We do a thing called the USTS, the U.S. Transgender Survey. Um, it's the most comprehensive study of transgender people's experiences in the country, or I should say transgender adults. Um, it's people 18 plus. 
And it really showed that transgender people and especially transgender people of color face so much more discrimination at every turn. I mean, it's everything from employment to uh, riding on the bus or the subway uh, to schools. And I mean, we can all agree that there's no reason that anyone should face hardship in any of those situations. Um, so, I mean, for me, I felt like I really got to, to see a lot of those dimensions in my daily life with how um, my gender has been, my perceived gender has changed, my gender itself didn't change, but how people saw me changed over time. Um, and that's just, that should be a scandal in our society. There's no way that we should, as a culture, tolerate uh, people being harassed uh, just because someone happens to notice or suspect that they're trans. Great, thank you. So if we flip that, what would you imagine living in a world where every part of your identity was safe, valued, respected? What would that look like for each of you? What would that open up for each of you? Um, can you even imagine that in your lives? So who would like to start that one? Sam, go ahead. You look like you're... <laughs> sure. Awesome. Trying to... I'm one of those people who, I don't know about any of you, but like I count to 10, like, don't be first all the time. Really try. Uh, but I always have thoughts. And Barbara, this is one of my favorite questions. I'm sorry. I'm like giddy. Uh, I love imagining worlds where I am treated equally because as an advocate, then I get to make that world reality. Like that's the greatest... Thing about being um, in the LGBTQ community is because of trailblazers and astounding people like Marsha P. Johnson and others, we get to turn those dreams into reality. We get to live in worlds that we create. So anyway, okay, sorry. Uh, all that being said, super excited for this question. So I think first off, wouldn't it be awesome if people just kind of relaxedly understood they, them as pronouns, right? Like I do actually believe that the world would be such an easier place if I didn't have to try to explain my pronouns to every single person I meet. Uh, because at some point you just get tired of it. So one, let's just get into a world where pronouns are so common that we just talk about them like, oh, like this is a thing that because I see you, I don't just know about you. So I should ask, right? Um, a lot of those kind of things. One other piece could be, I think, uh, I have to try to navigate. Uh, I would I would live in a world where my, my husband wouldn't have to try to explain my gender to others as well, right? Like there is just something about, you know, our partners and those who we love getting to just also live in a world without having to be an educator, right? That would be super, super low stress. Um, I would dream of living in a world where every trans and non-binary young person has a home, whether that be their, their bio family, their chosen family, their, their communal family, right? They would be in a place where just think, just imagine how much creative, beautiful energy would be there if we just let trans and non-binary young people be themselves, right? Like, we, you, th you thought the Sistine Chapel was good, like, move over. Um, like, we're ready, to, we're ready to take over. I could imagine a world where um, I could be the nerd, right? I could be the nuclear engineer without worrying that, that how I identify could get me fired, right? Like, that think of again move over Einstein like the trans kids are coming right like that's where I'm I believe um a, a world where we would be treated equally and respected that is a world I'm super ready to make uh happen but at least until then I can as you can see just smile from ear to ear thinking of the greatness we could bring how exciting how exciting that's wonderful the dreams um Ariana can you dream too? Sure, sure. Actually, you know, um, 
my dream is really come through my every time of my life at the position I have right now as a transgender person who they coming from one South American country when at this moment actually many of trans many people in my country um don't have the same privilege what I have in this amazing country who give me the opportunity to somebody call me, not somebody call me, to many people call me Ariana Lynn and 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 proof and talking about my talents beside I'm a transgender woman, I am living openly with HIV, or I am a, a Latina, or I am a, 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 a whatever whatever the label it is. I think um, we have to drink as I have a better quality of life, continuing dream. Uh, for me at this time and next month, what is the, the prime? It's going to be most, most, most real prime than ever because you can see amazing, non-binary, um, transgender woman in leadership position. They have a platform to many organizations as INCTE, as a task force, as Ariana Center, who provide platform to a transgender woman of color or no binary people or trans men, I have a voice. And that is what I drink every day when I wake up every morning. I dream and continue to have the same life what God put me and continue living in this amazing country one when we have to advocate all the time you know we have to advocate all the time is is nothing is 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 many things we need to fix it but the powerful and the passion and the amazing talent of the transgender and non-binary people and the leadership is going to be changed and going to be better for everybody so that is my dream wonderful and rigo how about you if everything about you was safe, valued, and respected, what would that look like for you? You're muted. Okay, there. sorry. The slowness with that, <laughs> me finding the button in time to get off of there with the moderator. Um, I mean, I one of the things that I think about a lot is the sensation of being the only. I think so many of us on uh, on this Zoom have had some kind of experience where we were the only person in the room who was who was X, who was whatever, who was trans, who was non-binary, who whatever whatever it is, even if it wasn't about gender, we all know what it's like to be the only one in that space and to feel that burden, to feel that. Um, uncertainty, the insecurity that comes with that of like, do I even deserve this? I mean, there's so many things that can come up for us emotionally when we have that um, that bur that weight to carry on our shoulders of being the only one. I think that the the ultimate measure of when we've made it, the measure of when uh, we are really being accepted and safe without question, is when we no longer feel like the only one, even if we actually are. Like what I mean is when we feel like the only and we feel that that burden and that weight, it's because we're either we're not being accepted or we we have so many experiences where we weren't ex accepted that we can't even um, we have we feel like we have to be on guard. Um, so even if the, the other people in the room are accepting, we, we don't trust. We don't trust yet all the way. Um, so when, when we get to the point as a culture where we really do accept people unequivocally, then I think that pressure of being the only goes away. Like then you can walk into a room and be the only trans person and you don't even have to, it doesn't have to bother you. It doesn't have to um, make you second guess everything because being trans isn't a liability anymore. Um, now, I think we'll always want to, um, you know, meet other trans people. I think there's, you know, social stuff there. We want to be in community, but it won't have to be, um, it won't have to feel bad or wrong or burdensome um, all of the time to just navigate, navigate these kinds of spaces and just go out in the world and have to second guess anything. So that that's my dream. That's my hope is that this um, the pressure of being the only one 
just evaporates and isn't even isn't even something we have to worry about anymore. Those are all three wonderful dreams, and and uh, we you know that's why we do what we do is to make those dreams come true at some point. So, what would an inclusive nationwide non discrimination protection law mean to you as an individual and also to the broader trans and non binary community? Go ahead, Sam. <laughs> Good, just making sure. Thanks so much. Um, I think to start off, it would be definitely a um, getting us to safe where we can make our own decisions. I think there is something really to be said for um, a non-discrimination kind of law, an inclusive non-discrimination law for trans individuals gets them to safe. You can make better decisions when you're not making them under duress, right? I, I work, my, my life's work is dedicated to ending the awful practice of conversion therapy, um, both here in the United States and around the globe. And conversion therapy happens because young people are under duress. They, they are being forced to experience this erasure um, because their parents say that that's the only way they can stay under this roof or the only way they can, uh, you know, come home or the only way that they can be around those whom they love. And so a person makes a decision that causes ir nearly irreparable harm. And so what would non-discrimination do? Non-discrimination kind of puts you back in the driver's seat. It says, you get to make your own decisions, right? Like, let's be honest, I don't always make the greatest decisions, but at least I would be able to make the, the decision on my own, rather than um, at the forced, uh, you know, edge um, that I'd be put under based on discrimination. So that's what I think uh, an inclusive one would be. It would be giving us the driver's seat again and, and letting us as trans and non-binary people um, honestly get to live like everybody else like it's not again it's not special rights it's just getting to be normal and I don't use normal as a positive I use it as a like a, a space of it's there they're getting to drive I'm tired of being in the passenger seat um I'm tired of at the airport worrying about how I'm going to be treated I am tired of going in for a home loan worrying how I'm going to be treated right but instead if I could start to say I get to drive, and I know that driving says, so I guess I'm, I'm using, I'm potentially, I apologize if that's uh, offensive, but like, that's, that's, that's something that's really important to me, being able to be the master of my own domain, the, the controller of my own world, that's important. So that's what I think an inclusive um, law, like the Equality Act, would do. Ariana, what would be your take on the idea of a national, nationwide protection meaningful to you and to you and to a broader your broader community yes also in my in my personal experience uh, as a professional right because as, as me, I, I make my transgender life as a, as a part of my uh, professional uh, um, things so as a professional we develop in one program what we call April program um, what is the part of the AP program is I identify as a transgender person of color with different and a lot of labels, uh, emerging leaders, because it's important as a leader, you give a time and give a space to other leaders. You cannot be perpetual every time as a leader and always um, uh, advocate for some something what you don't need it but you advocate just because you have something for to do. So I think it's so important to new leaders, emerging leaders, the youth, in, e even though um, a group of um, leaders who they are over 50 and uh, right now they are thinking it is important and get a voice and connecting with them when, 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 um, Congress electing persons, uh, people who they are uh, uh, power. Um, uh, we make uh, the lobby day, and uh, no, we we make um, we invite to the to uh, to the whole candidate for. We live in Wilton Manor, so Wilton Manor is the exam LGBT UCBD district in Florida. So that's why oh, the whole nationwide. So we trying to include the the the, the include the that one and invite to the um, candidate for mayors when there was an election time. And also we are uh, uh, connecting um, 
people with power and talking in different points at the specific in South Florida, what is the most, the HIV decriminalization law and, uh, and, and the work of, of the, and now we try to working with this uh, specific in Florida, with this gover uh, um, governor, we're trying to make so unfold laws for, for transgender individuals, right? And I think that is not possible, but I, I, I think uh, united and working together, we can change that and we can give opportunity to everybody. But also respect, also respect and have the history of the of the Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, right? A black and, trans, uh, and, and Puerto Rican transgender, both woman of colors and, and and give the opportunity now to the transgender and non-binary and trans men um, leaders um, and community, more leadership, more mindful in, in, in different ways. So that's why it's so important to work in together, partnership together and, and, and continue respect the work of each one because everybody is important. You know, the minimum work make a difference most, the most bigger, great intention. So I think that is most important. Thank you. There we go. How about you? What does the national non-discrimination protection mean to you? What as an individual and, and to the broader community that, that you're going to be representing, that you are representing? Well, in the, the most basic fundamental terms, it means less discrimination and a recourse when you face discrimination. Uh, there are a lot of people, um, well, there's a lot of institutions out there that are trying to do the right thing regardless, but there's also quite a lot that are only gonna do the right thing if they're required by law. For better or worse, um, we see this all the time in healthcare. For example, uh, health insurance companies uh, went over and over and over again, tried to deny transgender people health coverage. Uh, first, they tried to deny us coverage just on the basis of being trans, that that counted as a pre-existing condition um, and categorically then excluded us from, uh, from insurance plans. That, um, and then, you know, they got taken to court and eventually uh, our side won um, and you had the Affordable Care Act, which really critically uh, extended non-discrimination protections to us, at least in healthcare, um, and put it just in really clear black and white terms. So the insurance companies were like, fine. <laughs> um, it was only when they were required by law that they finally um, started uh, basically consistently allowing trans people to even be on our insurance, be on our insurance plans. But now we're finding that they still uh, need that enforcement um, in order to cover us for transition-related care uh, or even just to cover us for gender-specific procedures. What that means are gender-specific procedures are things that aren't even about you being trans, but instead they're healthcare procedures that are assumed to only be for people of one gender. So for example, how mammograms are assumed to only be for women um, or how prostate exams are assumed to only be for men. And then we see insurance companies uh, deny trans people that care uh, because we had this different gender marker on our health insurance plan and the automated system they use uh, says it's fraud. So all of this just, I think, goes to show that there are some companies out there that are only going to do the right thing when they are required by law to do it. And then when they are required by law, then they're like, fine, and then they do it. Um, so, and that's what the Equality Act would, would cover. I mean, the Equality Act would make it so obvious, it would make it so clear that you cannot discriminate against people for being trans or non-binary, that there's a lot of companies that then will be like, oh, fine. <laughs> and then they will finally give us the services that we need. Um, and the other thing I'll say just really quick is that if one of those companies then still messes up and still denies you, you would be able to do something about it. If we have, when we have the Equality Act, then you'll be able to file a complaint. Um, you'll be able, and, and you won't need a fancy, expensive attorney to do so. Instead, you will be able 
people to go to um, things like your state's human rights commission that does not require getting your own lawyer, but instead there's like forms you can download from websites and submit your claim. Um, so if we had the Equality Act, then if you are discriminated against, uh, you can do something about it. There's someone else you can speak to and file that complaint and, and get your rights um, without having to be rich enough to hire an attorney. So that's what the Equality Act, um, I think, means to me in the most simple terms is that less discrimination in the first place and uh, the ability to actually do something about it if you are discriminated against. Right. Wonderful. Recourse is so important. So, you know, we, um, all of us, each of us carry a variety of identities uh, besides our gender. Uh, uh, we also carry our, our sexual orientation, gender uh, identity, um, our class, our ability or disability, um, our faith. Um, from an intersectional perspective, um, what does, what about the need for a national equality act to cover all of the identities that each of us carry. Um, many of them are probably not even re represented tonight, but a few of them I know are. So how does that impact your lives and the lives of the people that you work with and serve? Go ahead, uh, Regal. Go ahead, Regal. There we go. I was trying to click that button in time. Um, well, so, I mean, well, one of the things I would bring up, and I'm sure Adriana and Sam have more to add to this as well, but um, there's one, I don't know, kind of factoid, I guess you could say, about the Equality Act that does not get, um, has not gotten as much attention recently which is that, okay, we tend to think of the Equality Act as being an LGBTQ thing. It's um, uh, for queer and trans people and non-binary people. But um, also it expands non-discrimination protections uh, in, on all sorts of other bases as well. So for example, when we think about race and discrimination, um, we're, we're, most of us are kind of used to the idea of thinking that it is illegal to discriminate against someone on the basis of race in employment or public transit um, or so on and so forth. And that's true, but actually the law was passed so long ago that it was passed, uh, it, it is not current enough to protect us in all the parts of modern life. So for example, um, it is indeed still illegal to discriminate against uh, someone for being black or brown or a person of color on the bus, but it's not illegal under federal law in an Uber or a Lyft because those that kind of ride sharing company didn't exist at the time of uh, the original Civil Rights Act. So the Equality Act would plug these holes. It would fill these gaps. Um, it would extend these protections to all the parts of daily life on all of this basis, on race, national origin, gender, so on and so forth. Um, and that's really, really important for those of us who are trans people of color. And it's also actually even important to cis people of color. It's just not a part that, you know, about the Equality Act that we talk about um, as often. Um, but I would really, you know, kind of plug that, <laughs> that one of the great things about the Equality Act is it, it brings our civil rights protections into the 21st century um, on, on all sorts of bases, including those of, of race and national origin. Very good. That's really important. I, I one could not have said it better. So I'm super glad Rico went first. Um, but uh, I will. I'll give the mnemonic for folks who maybe like it's easier to remember, which is this is modern non-discrim, right? Like this is the as I like to say, uh, right? This ain't my great grandma's uh, non-discrim. This is mine. Um, it's 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 recognizing for you know sometimes the first time that there are more gender identities than binary, um, right? Like that there are a variety of spaces where we should be treated equally. I, I am very tired, very tired of 
my rights being up to a judge, right? Uh, my, my identities and rights are only limited by what a judge's mind can be. Let's get those words written down. Let's not make people interpret discrimination as it should be, but rather get it into a space that is uh, more accessible. So yes, so everything Rigo said, and then if you're trying to be like, oh, but what, how does it work with my intersectional identities? This is the point, is that it's trying to make sure that discrimination in its modern form ends up in the dustbin of history. That's what the whole goal should be. Great, thank you for that. But Ariana, can you add to that? From a intersectional perspective, what, what are the needs for these, for these added protections from the Equality Act? Well, I think um, have to be more meaningful involvement when uh, more people who they are really, really was affected, in specific as a trans Latina. Uh, I think transgender who they are passing by uh, immigration services or something can be in the in the in in, in the in the in the, in the in the table of conversation, right? I I don't know if somebody know, but last year or in the last two years or three years, uh, ICE was in uh, um, in detention center was like three or four transgender was murdered there or, or died inside there, and nobody do nothing. And also um, 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 identify the murders of the transgender individuals every day, every year. We are identify the Tidor event, and we count each of one. But sometimes many of them, they don't, they don't have no, no information. No, they don't find the person who they are really, really uh, um, um, was uh, uh, um, killed them or something. So I think equality ad is, is so important for, for many of us to be protecting because many people, they think we are isolated or we are one or two, but we are growing now more than, we don't wait nine months to go to, to the society. I think we're going more and more every day. And, and also invest, when I'm talking about investigate the murders is because four years ago, last like past week, four years ago in, in, in Brunswick, Texas, uh, disappeared Kimberly Avila. And we're trying to find Kimberly Avila for many years. Uh, I was personally talking when, when her family, and, and you know how difficult it is when somebody uh, don't know what happened when then, and the family is still have that things, and we, they don't know, the, the, the police, the mayor, uh, everybody. So that kind of specific points of the real transgender community, and when the whole group we can unify and we can do some different for them. I can, I think we can create the, the difference. But uh, equality, ad, as I told you, is uh, so important and so huge um, a tool for the transgender individual and the non-conforming individuals to get more better quality of life and, and, and living more comfortable, right? My right. Comfort. Great. And you sort of led into the next question, which is how do we build genuine power and solidarity across LGBTQ plus communities of color in service of our broader movement for LGBTQ liberation. In other words, you know, we're people of a, a certain gender experience. We're part of the acronym, but there's a broader acronym. How do we engage that broader acronym, the, the lesbian, gay, the bisexual community who see in some cases, they don't understand the need that we see, but they also have their own needs. How do we, and we haven't got a great um, experience of interaction, uh, successful interaction among the broader LGBT community. How do we, how do we make that happen so that we have a broader movement for equality? Any thoughts? Sam, I knew you'd come up with something. Oh, of course, you know me, I have a thought. So uh, I return to one of my core ethos. Um, when, when in doubt and when in struggle, return to your values, right? One of my core values is that the word ally is a verb, 
not a noun that we 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 must do something with the information that we have um i also identify i said as, as bisexual we are without a doubt the largest part of the lgbtq community and yet without a doubt the least talked about um uh, it is constant to have it them rattle off lgbtq and have no mention of bisexual anywhere in the community i'm not saying this to, to negate a problem i am saying this as a space of that's why we have to create true allyship by doing something by by um you know as trans and non-binary individuals when we see someone seeking um uh refuge from uh from you know re uh, religious discrimination or economic discrimination, we have to be active and say, "I I have survived this type of discrimination before. Here, look, this is what I know at this point. I am I'm also happy to connect you to those who may know more than I. Right? Like that is that is allyship that will actually get us to do something. I I like to think of parents. Right? Parents and families and friends understand um love and they understand how to to be kind right we teach it to our kids all the time but then there is this kind of disjointed of like well how do i show that love in a way that um can be useful well you can talk to your to your political members about how discrimination is not showing love right like that's not showing compassion um you don't have to you don't have to try to like make it complicated but instead just make it active right like it's a, it's a very it's a i think we overcomplicate how hard it is to build a movement let's be super honest right a movement is just a bunch of people who care about each other and care about people that they will never meet but that share a common ideal or value we all share a common ideal and value of being respected so i think it sounds simple but it's not just telling our story right it's telling others stories. It's it's acting when we see someone else being hurt and saying, "I will do what I can uh, to make your life a little bit easier as well." Those are those are active allyship, which I think actually gets us closer to a movement that respects those of us uh, who you know come from marginal identities, who who makes it truly inclusive, and honestly, who wins. That is that is how um, I believe movements are made. to heads nodding thank you ariana how would you respond to that how do we build a genuine power and solidarity across the broader lgbt community i think uh, first of all as a transgender individual as a transgender person or, 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 or individual part of the lgbt community you have to know your power and what do you want to bring to the community and what do you want to bring to to the to the world right it's not just ask for something it's how you want to bring and also <clears throat> believe in your work because i truly believe in united states if you're really working hard and if you really working and conducting everything you can have a productive life i think uh, that is the that is first uh, uh for in my history um many many people they don't sometimes attack my work and everything but i know amazing people and amazing agencies or, or, or help uh, or person who they are key in developing better quality of life for services and and the whole florida because when i work i don't work just for me i just work for the whole transgender community and i think uh, give that respect and working together identify who is the agency or who is the person who they going to bring something and working and add to the table, you know, um, bring in good comments and respectfully, right? Respectfully when in the whole levels. And I think uh, that is what, how we can bring, uh, bring, well, we are amazing. We are a one amazing community in the whole world. And I think uh, we just need to be more networking, um, more, uh, focus and what and developing strategies to 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 educate others and sensibilize others about our work i think we're ready to to give a better 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 life to the next generation but it's important to working together and and, and communicate together thank you for that 
And Rodrigo, how about you? What's your take on building a broader co uh, connection between the LGBT community? Well, I think that so much of it is is just about putting one foot ahead in front of the other. I mean, I, I really resonated with what Sam said about, you know, maybe we overcomplicate uh, what it is to build a movement. I don't mean to be naive because it's a lot of work, but people have been doing this ahead of us for years and years and years. I mean, we have ancestors who worked on building a movement to get us to the place that we're at today, even if there's still more of a course to chart ahead of us. Um, you know, there's people who, who got us to this point now, um, and there's lessons to be learned from other movements. And so much of it is really about, um, well, from an activist sense on the political issues like this, it's about breaking it down and going, okay, what change am I trying to accomplish? Who's the decision maker who can make that change a reality? And how do I pressure that decision maker? Um, it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. It's like, so with the Equality Act, you know, what do we, we want to end it? We want protections from discrimination. Okay, so we want the Equality Act. Who's in charge of making sure the Equality Act uh, really becomes law? Right now it's the Senate. All right, and what do they listen to? A hell of a lot of constituents in their state calling them and telling them, I'm a voter and I need you to support the Equality Act. Or even if, they live in the state and they can't vote for whatever reason. Um, they're not old enough. They have a criminal record and the state has unjust laws against that. Um, they're not citizens, whatever it is. If they live in the state, they can still call a senator and go, I live in the state. I'm here. Um, I'm your constituent and I need you to support the Equality Act. Um, and so I think it's really um, from a, a political sense of building the movement. It's really about just thinking, what's the change I'm trying to achieve? Who's the decision maker who can get me that change? And how do I pressure them? Um, and then it's just showing up, showing up, showing up. Like all of you here tonight, it's amazing. We've got, what, 70 people here right now. Hope you stick around for the text bank after this. Um, and that's how we win. That's how we make it happen. It's just one foot in front of the other, one phone call, one text, one Zoom event at a time. That's how we win this. Great. Thank you. So we're coming down to the end of this op opportunity to talk, but what is, what's a positive affirmation that each of you would offer to the trans gender nonconforming communities that may feel vulnerable or targeted by the increase of anti-trans legislation that surfaced across the nation? This would be our closing question. So what message do you have as people struggle with what's happening in their localities. Go ahead, Roger, Rodrigo. Go ahead, Rigo. You know, I like to think that as activists, our job is not to predict the future, it's to shape it. We are the ones who can change the course of this. None of this is predetermined. I mean, this has been, it has been disheartening and a, a, just an outright attack to have to withstand this onslaught of anti-trans legislation. Um, but, and, you know, there's every reason to expect that the opposition is going to bring these bills up again next state legislative session next year. But it is not whether or not they're going to pass is not guaranteed. That's on us. That's on our allies. That's on our supporters um, and the people who live in these states. I mean, as activists, our job is to create the outcome that we want. It's not to sit by the sidelines and, and worry about whether or not we're going to get it done. It's to do everything in our power to get it done. Now, it can take a really long time to win these things, um, but we do tend to win. <laughs> you know, like the opposition is going after us um, in, in the way on trans sports bans and, and trans healthcare bans attacking youth because we actually already beat them on marriage equality. We actually already beat them on the trans bathroom bans. And we've, we're actually starting finally to beat them on public opinion. We're obviously not there yet, 
but there's a uh, way more people supporting trans rights today than did 10 years ago or 10 years before that. So it, that shows me that we're on the path. Um, the opposition is doing this to us because they're desperate um, and they see that more and more people are waking up and going, oh, you know what, like now that I'm learning about this trans thing, I guess, I guess it's not a big deal after all. Now that's not everyone yet, but it's a lot more people than it used to be. And that means we're on the path. So again, our job as activists is not to um, just plain worry about the future or predict the future, it's to shape it, it's to create it. So that's what I would lead as words of affirmation, that the future is in our hands. We actually do have the power to move the needle here. And I think all of you know that because you're here tonight. Um, and now it's a matter of, of getting all our friends to join us too, to expand the circle. Ariana, do you have some words, the positive affirmation for people feeling threatened and concerned at this moment? Yes, of course, as I told you, uh, I think I'm over here not just represent as Ariana. I represent a many transgender women of color who they are uh, working hard every time and make the difference and make impact in the hometown, you know, uh, uh, in, in Texas, in California, in Atlanta, in, in Minnesota. All that kind of transgender uh, in the woman of color, they are ready to working. And that's why I think this year going to be different pride because I'm going to, you're going to see the voice of the transgender community, the real voice of the transgender community or the non-binary people. And I think just working right now when they allies what we have um, uh, is so important to always founding and, and represent trans project and trans led organizations who really, really know what is need for us um, and continue working with this amazing networking, you know, with uh, uh, the task force, the NCTE and all agencies who they are working day and day to make the difference of the transgender community or put, the vo or put just the voice because, you know, it's just make action or, or do something for the, for the, for the community. So I, uh, I want to say thank you so much to the whole panelists and was an honor to uh, share the panel with you. And also thank you so much to the task force to invite, to invite me to this important conversation. And the, um, see, you, see you soon. <laughs> and Sam. Yeah, um, what's more to be said? I, I think the really important message that I would uh, say that while we're building that new world, um, we started with the dreams uh, of, that we were going for. Rigo expertly said, you know, that that we have to we have to we have to do something about it. We, we have to make those dreams kind of come true. Ar Ariana, like bringing in really important aspects that like this isn't hitting everyone equally. And then I'll I'll say then in that moment, in the moment between the current awfulness and the future goodness. We have to be a resource for each other. We have to know that we're not alone because I think as trans, trans and non-binary people, um, it's hard to trust that others are fighting for us. Like when we're calling in this, you know, or texting our legislators, we feel like we're the only one, but we're not, right? We're, we're, we're not alone in this. We, are, we are, are, are making sure about that, but we're gonna feel that we're alone. We have to know those feelings are okay, that we have to feel what we're experiencing, the, the fear, the, the scaredness, and say, I'm feeling like I'm alone. I know that I'm not, right? I, I, I'm feeling like uh, I don't have a place in this world. I know that I do, right? Like build, building that world and taking some of that action is really hard. Um, so again, I wouldn't be a good uh, suicide prevention advocate if I didn't say, take a breath, take your time, the world does not need you to change it um, in the next minute. You can have the next minute for yourself. Now, two minutes from now, I'm watching you. You got to go change the world. But for this minute, you can breathe. If you uh, need that that to be with someone, if, if you're an LGBT person of any age, you can call, text, or chat with the Trevor Project, and we will be there to listen. We won't have all the answers. We won't have all the solutions, but we'll be there so you will know that you're not alone. And then, as I said, 
two minutes from now, you can change the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What an amazing panel. Sam Britton from the Trevor Project, Ariana Lint from <coughs> Ariana Center, Rodrigo Henning Lettinen from the National Center for Transgender Equality. Thank you so much. I've really been honored to moderate this. I hope that uh, Timber is feeling better uh, and that Ezra Collins is getting well again. Uh, we miss them, but I'm thrilled that I had the opportunity to lead this conversation with you. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience. So as we leave you from this point, we're going to go into a musical interlude. Um, uh, Shushma Saha is going to perform Hero from the musical Interstate, uh, courtesy of Well, you're going to see it on the, on the screen when it comes up. Kit Yan and Melissa Lee um, made arrange for this. And thank you so much for the opportunity to moderate this and welcome you to this amazing panel. Thank you, everybody. And join us. Don't don't run away. Join us for the action portion after this, with the National LGBTQ Task Force Action Fund and NEAT as they lead us into how we put into action all the things we learned tonight. Thank you. We're getting set up for a screen share. Perfect. Dash, he's a poet and he's like me. I've been really obsessed with this new band, Queer Malady. They're a pretty big following, but they're still kind of underground, so they're extra cool. Um, the lead guy, Dash, he's a poet and he's like me. Well, except for the part where he's badass and everything figured out. But just like him, I've always felt different from other girls. I'm strong.
Try not to face another day You inspire